I'd like to entitle the message here, The Great Equalizer. The Great Equalizer. Now, we're not speaking of some kind of revenge here. We're not speaking of, well, I think there was a show or something. I never saw it. But The Equalizer, nope, nothing about a vigilante story here. Rather, we're speaking about a much more fundamental equality the one thing that truly brings about, the one thing that really truly brings that about, and that is the gospel. The gospel is the great equalizer. It is something universal to every person, every race. It applies to every class, rich or poor. Every person stands guilty before God and in need of a savior. And then any person that receives that free gift is his son, his daughter. Now, division amongst groups is something that the church has had from its very inception. In fact, we're going to look, and a lot of the scriptures of the New Testament are specifically about this issue, about groups being divided against each other in the church. And it's something that the early church fathers warns against. It's something that we find throughout the New Testament. In the beginning, it was initially a distinction between Jews and Gentiles. And there was a lot of strife between the Jewish community that were Christians and the Gentile Christ- community that were Christians. And, of course, the big reason for that is because Christianity has Jewish roots. Jesus grew up as a Jew. All of the apostles were Jews. So it's not surprising that, you know, most of the Christians were Jews. And then, of course, there was this flood of the Gentiles coming in. The new covenant was being expounded and explained as to how we didn't have to follow the ceremonial laws. And that was really hard for a lot of people. Really hard. In fact, we can't even, I don't think we can exactly imagine how hard that would be. As an example, I think, I know, I believe, we're, we're all familiar with these things, but sometimes it helps, I think, to, to look at some of the examples. It wasn't just that the Jews didn't like the Gentiles. It's that, according to the ceremonial laws, they would have been unclean to be with a Gentile. A Gentile will have, at some point, eaten something that a Jew was forbidden to eat. It, it was going to happen. They couldn't, they could have eaten pork or some other things. Any of the, you know, there's tons of things that Gentiles would eat that Jews could not. And until the Gentile went through the ritual cleansing, they would have been unclean. So that meant the Gentiles went through their lives entirely unclean. And according to Old Testament law, if you then were with a person who was ceremonially unclean, you were also going to be ceremonially unclean. If you touched, you shook hands with them, if you had some kind of, a, you know, touched them in any way or in the same house with them. So I think this can help us to see that and understand, no wonder the Jews thought the Gentiles, and of course there's that controversy with Peter when he went in and ate with Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. If he did that, he was ceremonially unclean. Anyone he came in contact with and shook hands with, they were ceremonially unclean. And so it was not just like a superficial thing. There was a radical difference between a Jew and a Gentile in every part of their life, in every way they were to behave. And the New Testament is full of examples of breaking down that division and showing that in Christ, everyone is one. We are one body. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 3. And I've got a number of verses, so we're definitely not going to turn to all of them, but let's we're going to turn to a few of them. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Galatians 3, verse 28. Here Paul says, Again, Galatians 3, 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. Female, For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And as we were mentioning, this is an absolutely radical statement. When Paul says this, now, there were certainly hints at this kind of thing in the Old Testament, and, you know, it was something that had been begun to be propagated by the apostles in Acts chapter 10, like we said, when Peter went to the Gentiles. So there was this, but it was still, what Paul is saying here is something that was hard for a lot of people to digest. And Paul made it clear here, though, that the gospel is the great equalizer, that in Jesus Christ, all these diverse groups are one. If you're a Jew or a Gentile, doesn't matter. If you are in Christ, you're a member of the same body. If you're male or female, you are still a member of the same body of Christ. And if you're a slave person or a free person, you know, two totally separate classes, and yet the gospel makes all one. In the modern context, it would be like saying, you know, the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, someone so extremely important, and the person who's on the street begging, the homeless person, if they come to Christ, they are of equal value to God. And they are still a member of the same body of Christ. 
And now we're going to talk later. It's not a matter of breaking down responsibilities. There's difference of roles. We're going to look at that at the very end. But the point is here, Paul also says, and we're not going to turn there, but Ephesians chapter 6, where he says to servants and to masters alike, you are both to serve and glorify God in whatever station of life you find yourself in. You know, if you're masters, remember you're Christ's servants. And if you're servants, remember that Christ is also your master. And, and Paul brings about in all of these writings an equality in the sense that God is our father. God is our master. It doesn't matter our social status in life. We all serve one God. And we have to remember that when we treat other people, regardless of their race, regardless of their social status, regardless of anything else, there is an equality that is brought about by the gospel. Because we all are of equal value before God. What we see in the gospel is that each life is precious. Each soul is precious. From the greatest to the smallest, each one is precious. His blood has bought each of us and each of us stand dependent upon him for everything. We don't have to turn there, but I'll read a passage. Acts chapter 17, verse 24 through 26. Acts seventeen twenty four through 26 says, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of all mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. God made from one man everyone we see. Every race, every person. And in Christ, we are brothers and sisters. We are brothers and sisters. He is our Father. And this equality of the body, it does not mean that we're all the same and that we all have the same purpose, but it does mean that we all can participate in the life of the church. And in the life of the church, there is equality such that each of us has a role to play and each of us is important. I'm not worth more than any of you. We all have that immense value of being made in the image of God because we are humans. And because God, who made from, he made every grace, every tribe, every person, you know, from one. And from that came everything. And and he gives to all of us, as he says, you know, life and breath. And in that same passage later, it says, in whom we live and move and have our being. And he still gives life to each person. There's an equality there. Well, again, we're not going to turn there, but Exodus 30, verse 11 through 16, it talks about the census, when Moses takes the census in Exodus chapter 30, verse 11 through 16. And in this particular time, when they take the census, and I'll just read verse 15, which says, The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than the half shekel when you give the Lord's offering to make an atonement for your lives. Now, we know there are times in Scripture where... Offerings are according to need, according to ability to pay. You know, with, there were different offerings when you sinned, you know, or, you know, if you were rich, you would pay so much. If you were, um, you know, like the dedication, if you had a dedication, the rich would offer such big offering and the poor less, etc., because it was according to ability to pay. But when it came time here where it talks about making an offering for their lives, it didn't matter. They all had to pay the same. It's because there's no difference in value. It didn't matter. The poor man's life is worth just as much as the rich man's life. Both of them needed the same atonement, as it were. Now, of course, we know this is an Old Testament type. We know the atonement. We have our atonement when Christ died to, to ransom us. And But there's no difference in value. There's no difference in value there. Before God, we're all sinners. And we know the verse very well, Romans 3.23. I think we could all recite it. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it's a wonderful verse. We usually use it in witnessing to show that we all need a Savior. Now, that's absolutely true. The main context, though, what this is a part of in Romans chapter 3, is Paul proving that both Jew and Gentile are justly condemned by a holy God. It's part of that. He starts, you know, with chapter 1 and saying, you know, this is the denigration of mankind. And then in chapter 2, he goes on to say, Jew, now you think you're without excuse? And he goes to show, especially throughout chapters 2 and 3, how the Jew has no excuse because they have the law, but they haven't kept it. 
And so the summation of this in, in verse 23, when we say, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, is to show that there is equality between the Jew and the Gentile. There is not a Jewish church and a Christian church. There's one church. Now, I know we're not dealing with the Jew and Christian thing here, but I, I, this is for a purpose, right? I mean, none of us are, we don't have any Jews in our midst. We, I don't know very many Jews. And, you know, but the point is, it's not that. But the point is, if God can reconcile the Jews and the Gentiles, there is no rift or division that he cannot reconcile. If, if there is such a distinction between the Jew and the Gentile, they're so radically different that if God can say, I'm going to take a Gentile and bring him in and make him the same body as I'm going to make the Jews, he can take any race, he can take any people, he can take any tribe, and he can eliminate every division between them and make them one for the glory of his name. Earlier in chapter 3 there, Paul says, it's speaking specifically against the Jews or those who would say we have the law as our benefit. He says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. And the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. Everyone stands equally guilty that all might be equally justified by the grace of God. There's no race of people, no class of society, no group that is excluded. The gospel call is universal. It is absolutely universal to all. No one is excluded. Neither excluded from the condemnation of sin, nor the promise of justification through the free grace of God. All are equal. We already mentioned this when Peter went in Acts chapter 10. We know he went to carry the gospel to the Gentiles. Initially, reluctantly. Remember, the Lord gave him a vision three times. To go, you know, to prepare him so that when the people came and the Holy Spirit spoke to him, his heart was prepared. You know, it wasn't like with the moment he got an invitation, he's like, yep, that's where I'm going. God gave him a vision and he did it three times. It wasn't, it was three times that Peter said, no, Lord. And the Lord did it again at each time, you know, but, you know, we thank the Lord that Peter did go because we're Gentiles. Thank the Lord that Peter went. And Peter says, when he saw how God had orchestrated the whole thing, before he even spoke, really, before the message went out and he saw the Holy Spirit come upon them, before that, he says, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. And, you know, Peter had seen, he saw, you know what, God gave me these visions, and then they came and got me. And then Cornelius explained to me how he, God had sent an angel for them to call me. He just saw the hand of God and he said, I know it. God's no respecter of persons. God is not partial. And the New Testament is full of those kinds of references. It's full of references of saying that the the wall is broken down. And we don't focus on them that much. And, and I'm not saying we should necessarily because we don't really have a division right now between Jews and Gentiles. You know, there's no, we don't have any Jews in our church. I mean, we'd welcome them if they wanted to come. You know, obviously there'd be no issues there. But that's the point. We, we don't typically speak about it because it isn't an issue we, 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 we come in contact with. But it was very prevalent in the early church. It was probably the chief problem because it's throughout every, nearly every epistle mentions it. Well, here's another example. We all know the song. It's come, most of it comes from Ephesians chapter two, verse fourteen. He is our peace, who has broken down every wall. We know that song, right? Now it's a great song. I'm not. I'm not speaking against that song, you know. But but the context of it is totally different. Like the, con, the context of the song, we're talking. You know, he is our peace. Cast all your cares on him. It's talking about you know peace with God and that kind of thing. In the context of where it is in Ephesians, the wall that's being broken down is the wall between the Jew and the Gentile. It, throughout that whole passage of Ephesians, he's saying, look, he's made both one. He's taken two groups that are totally separate. You who are far off, now you're called. And he's is our peace. He's broken down every wall of division. And so this, that again, I'm nothing against the song. I'm not trying to say we should, you know, there's certainly different applications we can take from, from verses in that. But I, just to say that this is something that the New Testament is absolutely full of, that the gospel is the equalizer. It is the breaking down of the barrier between peoples and saying everyone is one in Christ. That when we accept him, it doesn't matter what our background was. It doesn't matter what our social status is. It doesn't matter whether we have a lot of money or a little money. It doesn't matter who our father and or our mother was. 
We are part of one body of Christ. And as members of one body, we together serve the Lord for his purposes. And if there could be equality between Jew and Gentile, there can be equality between any Gentile group. If there could be equality between Jew and Gentile and those who were so radically different in everything that they did, then there can be equality between every Gentile group. Now, in closing, it's not closing, closing, as in this is like, you know, one minute. This is like closing area section. <laughs> All right. I didn't want anyone to think, oh, that means he's going to say like, no, we got just a couple things here. But the, the point is, when we speak about equality, I don't mean the radical equality that means everyone has the same thing because that's not the scriptural equality that we see. So just a couple more points here. For the sake of time, I'm not going to get into any more than just two here. Uh, but we're, when we're talking about equal, equal, where we are equal, what do we mean? So first, one thing we do mean, and then second, one thing we do not mean. All right? So we're going to have both of those. So first, when we say that people are treated equally, what do we mean? Well, James chapter 2, yeah, let's turn there. We haven't turned to many, have we? I've just been kind of spouting them off. All right, James chapter 2, verse 1 through 9. James 2, 1 through 9. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto you, unto your assembly, a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? And I think we'll just stop there for, for now. The rest of the passage is similar kind of thing. And here, James rebukes those who say, well, you treat the poor man a certain way and you treat the rich man a differently. And you say to the rich man, look, you get a great seat. You know, come, have the best place. But if you're poor coming off the street, you know what, you just sit back there. You know, you're not really important. And James absolutely rebukes that kind of partiality, where we treat people differently based on their whatever social standing they have. Where He absolutely rebukes that. And he says, there is no partiality with God. And to do so, he says, you're judges of evil thoughts. You have impure motives. And he goes on. There's a lot more he says about that, but he, he absolutely condemns that. And so should we. We are to, everyone is equal before God and should have equal justice under the law. And I'm not necessarily even speaking, it should be yes nationally, but that is a bedrock Christian principle whereby we treat everyone equally. Regardless, we don't care whether they're poor or whether they're rich, whether we're one race or another, we treat everyone equally because all are equally loved by God, all are equally bought by the same blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for all man. The Old Testament law actually had this same standard as well. The biblical standard is equality before the law. And I'm just going to read a couple verses here. Exodus 23, verse 2 and 3, it says, You shall not fall in with the many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit siding with the many so as to pervert justice, nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. It's Exodus 23, 2 and 3. And also Leviticus 19, 15 says this. Leviticus 19, 15 you shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. No mob justice. You don't follow just because a crowd is doing it. You don't judge that way. Don't judge for the poor. Because someone's poor, you don't have pity on them and judge when they aren't in the right, when they aren't true. You don't judge for them. You don't give them that. And you don't judge for the rich because you're looking to incur favor. That's the biblical standard. It doesn't matter whether the person is right. I'm sorry, whether the person is rich, whether they're poor. It doesn't matter if everyone else wants to do it. It doesn't matter what the popular opinion is in the sense of maybe no one liked this guy. You know, this guy, he's been a real menace around the neighborhood. No one likes him. If he didn't do it, he doesn't get condemned. He doesn't get a harsher sentence because no one likes him. That's the biblical standard. That's biblical justice. Another term that could be used is impartial justice or blind justice. That's the biblical standard. Equality before the law, where no person is favored regardless of any of their standings. It doesn't matter. Only the truth matters. 
and it's called righteous judgment. Now, at times in history, this has swung a lot of different ways. There have often been times where the tendency was to give someone a favorable judgment if they're powerful or well-connected. You know, they could get by with anything because they could, like, the judge doesn't want to condemn because he's hoping he can get a bribe from it. He's hoping to incur favor. He doesn't want to. That happens. It also, there are times when people will judge for the poor because they pity the person. And they're like, eh, you know what? He just stole from that rich person over there. Big deal. Rich person didn't need it. That's not true justice. It doesn't matter who did it. It doesn't matter who they did it to. The biblical standard is equal justice under the law, regardless of, of anything else. So when we talk about everyone being equal, we're talking about an equal application of justice. Everyone treated equally. And the second thing is what it did not mean, what equal equal does not mean that we are all exactly the same. We do not all have the same station. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is probably the most well-known example of this, and it explains it in great detail, which we will not go into tonight. We're just going to read three verses. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and these are our last verses for the night, so we can kind of say this is in closing. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 7. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is all the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Or to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. As I said, we don't have time. The whole chapter, it's, it's, it's really wonderful. It's one of my, I really love this chapter. I know I like a lot of them, but this one's really good. You know, the example of the body of Christ and how God brings it out, or, you know, he uses Paul to, to, to show that. And it's just an amazing exposition on the church. And almost this entire chapter speaks of it. And we are all one body in Christ. All of us. Each member is important. There's no member that can be ignored. We all have that kind of an equality where God values each and every one of us and every single one of us has a part to play in his body. In this chapter, Paul rebukes those who say, oh, I don't have need of you. If someone looks at, you know, he says in the natural body, he compares it and says, should the hand say, I don't need you, Mr. Foot? You know, should the eye say, I don't need you, Mr. Ear? I'm paraphrasing it here, but... (laughs) You know, the the point is that we need every single part of our body. I don't want to do without my eyes. I don't do without my ears. and don't do without my hands or my feet. I, I like each part to function as it should. And when that happens, the body is healthy and it accomplishes its purpose. It accomplishes its mission. And such is the equality that is in the body. The equality is one part because it's different, can't say to the other, I don't need you. And the other, the part, another part can't say, well, no one needs me. No, each part of the body is necessary. And that's the equality that we have in Christ. Where although we are different and not all of us do the same thing, yet we are valued equally and we are necessary for the functioning of the body as the whole. There are many things that you can do that I can't. There are many people you can reach that I can't. And God only knows what he wants to do with each one. And it doesn't matter our race, our social status. It doesn't matter our gender. It doesn't matter what we are. We are called and loved by God, and we're united together as members of one body. Each of us have that unique role to play. Different roles, how the Lord wants to use us. We're judged individually by God because he knows the role that each of us is to fulfill. But corporately, we all serve one master. Before God, we are equal, and no one can claim to be better than another. We can't say, my role's better, I'm more important. Each one is important. And the gospel is that equalizer. It is the thing that says, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, there is one blood, blood that has saved you. There is one gospel but whereby we are called. Though you and I may be different, very different, In the eyes of God, we are all equal. He is not a respecter of persons, but he loves each one and will use us according to his grand design 
in the way that he see fit. Amen.